installing cybersecurity tools to protect elections is tougher than it looks. Information operations continue to pose the most prominent foreign threat to U.S. midterm elections, although there are concerns about voting machine security. Coin Tracker looks like a trader's tool with a side order of malware. Video embedded in Microsoft Word documents can carry malicious payloads through detection systems. We've got some hardware worries and sanctions, and competing visions of norms in cyberspace. Now a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Observe It. It's 2018. Traditional data loss prevention tools aren't cutting it anymore. They're too difficult to deploy, too time-consuming to maintain, and too heavy on the endpoint. They are high maintenance and require endless fine-tuning. It's time to take a more modern approach. With Observe It, you can detect insider threats, investigate incidents quickly, and prevent data loss. With its lightweight agent and out-of-the-box insider threat library, Observe-It is quick to deploy and far more effective at stopping data from leaving your organization. That's because Observe-It focuses on user behavior. It's built to detect and respond to insider threats, and it's extremely difficult even for the most technical users to bypass. Bring your data loss prevention strategy into the modern era with Observe-It. Learn more at observeit.com slash cyberwire. That's observeit.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Observeit for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the Cyberwire podcast is provided by Silence. From the Cyberwire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your Cyberwire summary for Tuesday, October 30th, 2018. Here's a challenge most corporate CISOs will find has a familiar ring but U.S. state election officials seem to be encountering it as a novelty. They're gratified by offers of free security tools from cybersecurity companies, but as many CISOs would authenticate, they're finding those tools confusing and in many cases beyond their ability to use. The companies and the tools they're offering are well-known and quite reputable, so this isn't a case of snake oil peddlers passing out loss leaders in Hicksville. CyberScoop and ZDNet note the companies who've made the offers and their names you'll recognize and may well use yourself. McAfee, Cloudflare, Jigsaw, which is a Google offering, Synac, Akamai, Silent, Centrify, Microsoft, Valamail, Facebook, Symantec, Netscout, and 1Password. And this is by no means a complete list. We think, from what we've seen, that while of course companies want to showcase their products and solutions, there's a genuinely public-spirited impulse behind a good many of their offers. There are some concerns about the technical security of the voting infrastructure, worries about hacking proper. There have been complaints of glitchy voting machines in Texas, for example, and there's a certain climate of uneasiness, according to the Washington Post, surrounding the companies that produce the tools used at the polling places. The Post notes that three companies, ES&S, Dominion Voting Systems, and Hart InterCivic, supply and service about 90% of the country's voting machines, and that their security could do with an outside look. The companies themselves say concerns are overblown. But at least with respect to the U.S. midterm elections, most of the foreign cyber operations observed continue to be influence operations conducted over social media by bots and sock puppets. Their activities are opportunistic and inflammatory. They're not so much interested in any particular electoral outcomes— as they are in inducing mistrust along pre-existing fissures of the targeted societies. Their messaging, therefore, is negative, destructive, not aimed at pushing any particular worldview, but rather at demolishing such worldviews as may conduce to healthy civil society. So the challenge is so far mostly one of information operations, and in this regard Russia especially is seen as playing a weak hand very effectively. It will be interesting to learn how U.S. Cyber Command's troll hunting has been proceeding once that history can be told. In the meantime, good hunting to everyone at Fort Meade. The problems of election influence are to a significant extent problems for the private sector. Facebook in particular has been working not so much on viewpoint censorship or content moderation as it has on identifying and expunging what it calls coordinated inauthenticity, finding bots and bogus accounts and booting them off its platform. The same has been true to a markedly lesser but still discernible extent of Twitter. The approach seems promising because it seems to offer some promise of success without doing violence to freedom of speech or association, 
and since bots, not being even artificial persons, enjoy no natural or legal rights. There are, however, signs of a growing appetite for censorship, a tendency against which organizations like the Electronic Frontier Foundation have for some time cautioned against. Iranian officials say President Rouhani's phone was recently compromised and would be replaced. Their announcement was terse and offered neither details nor attribution, but the AP notes that the greater and lesser Satans, operating from their respective hells of Washington and Tel Aviv, are the usual suspects in Tehran when it comes to Iranian suspicions of espionage. As the controversy over the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi continues, and with it concerns about Saudi policy toward dissenters generally, Motherboard describes the apparent role played by Saudi al Qatani, a.k.a. Mr. Hashtag, a close advisor to Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, in obtaining surveillance software from Milan-based hacking team. Saudi Arabia has been interested in acquiring lawful intercept tools, as such things are called in the market, not only from Italy's hacking team, but from elsewhere as well. The Jerusalem Post describes the Saudis' surprising willingness to purchase other espionage tools from Israeli sources. They put the kingdom's purchases at $250 million. There's a popular notion that cybersecurity is suffering from a skills gap, with a lack of qualified, properly trained professionals to fill available positions. Raoul Kashap is CEO at Awake Security, and solving this problem is of particular interest to him. I've been thinking about this in many places. You know, I've been a serial entrepreneur in uh, in the in the world of cybersecurity. I've been doing, I've built several technologies. So there is one part where you can look at solving the problem by building intelligent solutions. The other aspect is uh, how do you really uh, look at solving the people problem because there aren't enough people, and that is something uh, you have to have a long term vision and a strategy uh wherein you know how can uh, you inspire people and, and and have people consider cyber security as a lucrative uh, career op- opportunity and an option right so yeah so uh, i've been focused on both of those aspects uh, at a personal level i've been looking at uh, you know after doing some analysis i found that most of the fresh people coming in the industry, uh, they kind of make decisions or or try to form decisions about their career when they are in their high school time frame. And and what kind of opportunities do you find yourself having there? Are are the high schools open to this sort of thing? So uh, I actually signed up with a with a group called Skillify. It, it's an it's a mentorship program. Uh, I think it covers the entire LA, all the school districts in in LA region. It's a pretty big pool of schools. So I've been using that program but now and then whenever I, I get an opportunity and whenever there's a, a high school kid who's interested to know more about cybersecurity. So I've been using that uh, pretty actively uh, to build out uh, and kind of uh, have as much uh, reach out to, to students as much as I possibly can. Now, when you interact with uh, students who are in their high school years, what what's the situation there? Do you find that they have any common misperceptions when it comes to careers in cybersecurity? Oh yes, I mean uh, it actually varies across the board. You know, uh, so m- most of the kids, uh, you know, uh, whom I talk to are looking at cybersecurity because they are pretty much, I would say, influenced by Hollywood, if I may. Uh, so they think of this as you know, you know as, as a cool uh, area to look at, and 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 they have a perception about a, which is which is very Hollywood style esque from what I have seen. In some sense, cybersecurity is definitely a very exciting, fast paced, fast moving, uh, and a very high impact job as well. But at the same time, there's a lot of work and a lot of uh, you know uh, expertise that you need behind the scenes to really become a, a top notch cybersecurity professional. Now, what about uh, this notion of uh, the industry reaching out to people from different disciplines? We've heard of companies uh, looking towards people who've studied music, you know, outside of the the, the normal uh, computer science pipeline. Yes. Uh, in fact, I, I, I have personally worked with several uh, folks who have had no cyber, who have had no science background, no computer skills, and who have done extremely well in, in cybersecurity, right? So it's a skill and a skill can be acquired. Uh, you just need to be willing to acquire the skill and should be interested in that domain, 
right? Uh, so uh, I kind of tell everybody that you have to come with an open mind. You you don't really necessarily have to be, uh, you know, and a, a top notch student doing having a, almost a, a grades all the time to be a top notch cybersecurity professional, right? You, there are specific skills, you know, specific mindset you need to develop uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, and if you can incubate and build that, you can really move fast up the ladders and, and build a, a good career for yourself. That's Raul Kashap from Awake Security. Malwarebytes warns that a Mac app, CoinTicker, installs keyloggers and backdoors along with its handy altcoin price tracker. It looks like a legitimate app, but to install CoinTicker is to invite Nemesis into your digital life. It's an interesting bit of cryptocurrency-themed malware. Instead of directly seeking to loot people's wallets, it exploits their enthusiasm for cryptocurrency to induce them to swallow the bait of a trader's ticker. Researchers at Simulate demonstrate a way of infecting Word documents by introducing malicious code into embedded video. The attack evades common forms of detection. There are two more bits of concern about Chinese hardware. The director of the Australian Signals Directorate warns that using high-risk Chinese telecom devices poses a threat to water and power infrastructure. The devices of concern are principally Huawei and ZTE equipment. And in the U.S., the Department of Commerce has banned U.S. companies from doing business with Chinese chipmaker Fujian Xinhua Integrated Circuit. The grounds for the ban are that the company poses a risk to national security insofar as it's deemed likely to cooperate with the Chinese government in activities contrary to the legitimate interests of the United States. It's striking that the ban that's expected to deal Fujian a severe blow is a ban on selling to them, not buying from them. In this, it resembles the earlier, now relaxed sanctions that did so much damage to ZTE earlier this year. Finally, Russia and the U.S. have offered the U.N. predictably competing proposals for international norms of conduct in cyberspace, the former favored by authoritarians, the other by liberal democracies. It's time to tell you about our sponsor, Mantech. The cyber threat is growing, but so is the cyber talent gap. By 2019, ISACA predicts a 2 million global shortage of skilled professionals to meet demands. Mantech has the answer. They've been designing, building, and staffing Department of Defense cyber ranges for more than 10 years. With Mantech's Advanced Cyber Range Environment, or ACRE, organizations of any size can develop their own core of cyber professionals. Acre uses more than a dozen proprietary tools, techniques, and processes to emulate any network environment, regardless of size or complexity. Train, evaluate tools, conduct security architecture testing, and undergo live fire exercises on an exact replica of your own network environment. And do it with instructors who understand both offensive and defensive cyber. Mantech helps you think like your adversary and outmaneuver them. This is Advantage Mantech. See how Mantech can work to your advantage. Go to mantech.com slash cyber today. That's mantech.com slash cyber. And we thank Mantech for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Robert M. Lee. He's the CEO at Dragos. Robert, it's great to have you back. Um, I want to sort of get a reality check here when it comes to EMPs, electromagnetic pulses. This is one of those things that comes up from time to time as being one of the great threats to uh, the power grid, our nation, um, everything. (laughs) And so uh, I figured let's check in. And uh, what's the reality here? First of all, what are we talking about? Yeah, I hope you're ready for like your email and comment section on this one to blow up. EMP. The the idea is that, and usually, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that create EMP, but but the the idea and in, in the scenario that's often purported is that a state power uh, will use a a nuclear weapon and detonate it at a certain you know height above uh, the United States. And the EMP from that warhead or that ICBM, that, that capability, uh, will be able to knock out significant portions of the electric power grid and, and other aspects of our daily life or solar flares. And so there's, there's science to the, sort of the EMP discussion. And 
aspects of solar flares and, and EMP, like it's very much considered. And in fact, the, the Department of Energy has done studies before and go, you know what, there, there's some things we should do. And so you have to do certain levels of shielding and electric wiring and, and, and you know, power grid operators are fairly aware, well aware of what they need to do from uh, like shielding perspectives. And they do it. And I think that's the, the thing that doesn't get represented well is it's not like the electric community is like EMPs don't exist. No, we, we fully understand that there, there's, there is such a thing as EMPs and there are natural scenarios that can occur. And so shielding is important. It, it's usually an argument of what type of scenarios and how much shielding and what type of protections need to be put in place that, that gets a little spun out of control. And when you're talking about detonating a nuclear weapon above, you know, any major city or, or portion of the United States, that's where the science goes off the rails a little bit. There's some there's some variables that are not fully well understood, and I think some people extending the conversation a little bit further um, than it probably should be. And it also then comes down to like the scenarios of okay, so you're telling me that Russia or North Korea or China uh, they're going to launch a nuclear weapon at us, but they're not going to actually try to hit us. They're going to just aim a little high and hope that it actually works. And, you know, I mean, there, there's so many different aspects. You, you can go down to the science discussion. You can go down the does it even make sense in rational theory kind of discussion. I mean, there, there's a lot of elements to this. But here's what I think is the important thing for everyone to take away is, one, EMP and, and, and shielding from electromagnetic pulses of, of any type has been done with electric grid operators to a level that the Department of Energy and uh, the U.S. government have found uh, successful and and appropriate. The extra level and the idea that we're going to build like shielding containers around transmission units and things, it, it, there's no proof that we actually should. Um, it, it sounds actually like everything points to it being extremely far-fetched. So it's not like we're just lacking proof. It, it actually points the other direction of this doesn't seem sound at all. And it comes at an inordinate expense. And what makes it even more difficult is the conversations then sort of extend to be a little bit misleading. And, and, and uh, it's very difficult to like, there's very smart people on this discussion. So I, I try not to just throw people on the bus, but it, it gets to a point of being misleading where to have the EMP discussion, it almost gets hidden inside of other discussions. And, and I have myself have found myself in a situation where I'll be asked to, go present at, you know, uh, Congress and to the staffers. And they say it's a cybersecurity event. I'm like, okay. And I go to like speak on cyber. And it turns out it's an EMP event, but they couldn't get anybody to show up. So they asked me to come speak on cyber. So people would show up and then they tell, tell them about EMP. Or hmm. I give a quote to, you know, a reporter who's asking questions about cyber attacks. And I, I have a nuanced take on, yeah, you know, cyber attacks are real and there's real threats to infrastructure, but our infrastructure is actually pretty reliable and here's like a balance between it. And then they cut off all of my nuance and they just capture the cyber attacks are real and, you know, grid's going down um, portions of the quote and then they tack it on to EMP stories. And, and what I've found is if you're in any walk of life, if the position you're taking isn't sound and well-founded on its own, and you have to sort of bait people into it with other topics or misrepresent people's quotes to sort of tell a story, I'm less likely to be empathetic with the story you're trying to tell. And I think others should be very careful in a lot of the EMP discussion. Rob Lee, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all the stories mentioned in today's podcast, check out our daily news brief at thecyberwire.com. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silance. To find out how Silance can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit Silance.com. And Silance is not just a sponsor, we actually use their products to help protect our systems here at the CyberWire. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, VMware, creators of Workspace ONE Intelligence. Learn more at VMware.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our CyberWire editor is John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Iben, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.